Hello, so in this video I'm going to take you through an introduction to bond enthalpy for the higher chemistry course and this falls within unit 3. So by the end of this video, hopefully you will know the definition of bond enthalpy. You'll be able to use bond enthalpy values that are given to you in the data booklet to help you determine how strong a bond is relative to another bond. And then lastly, how a bond enthalpy or how bond enthalpy values relate to reactions being endothermic or exothermic. So first of all, what is bond enthalpy? So again, there's a standard definition. It doesn't really get asked that much, but you still need to understand what it means. So bond enthalpy is the energy that's required to break one mole of a specified bond. So specified bond means, for example, a hydrogen to hydrogen bond, or a carbon to carbon single bond, or a hydrogen to oxygen single bond. Okay, any bond, if you want to break one mole of them, that's the amount of energy you need to put in. Well, that's what a bond enthalpy is. So, for example, if you are going to break down H2 into two hydrogen atoms, so that means you are breaking a hydrogen to hydrogen bond. So it's quite often helpful when you're doing bond enthalpy calculations that you draw the molecule out. So we're going from H to H to H and H. So we are breaking one hydrogen to hydrogen bond. So the bond enthalpy value for this is 436 kilojoules. And it's a positive energy change because to break a bond, you need to put energy in. So I kind of think of it as like karate chopping the bond in half. So if you're going to karate, karate chop something, you're probably going to have to use some of your own energy. Okay, so if you want to break one mole of hydrogen to hydrogen bonds, you're going to need to put in 436 kilojoules of energy. So as I said already, bond breaking is an endothermic process. So you have to put energy into it. So you need to remember that conversely, bond making is then exothermic. So that means you get energy out when you make a bond. Um, so there is a little thing you can use to remember this. Bendy Mexicans. I don't know if any of you know a bendy Mexican, but basically it helps you remember that breaking is endothermic and making is exothermic. Okay, so breaking is endo, making is exo. Okay, so to break a bond, you put energy in because you're like karate chopping it in half. When you make a bond, you get energy back out. And that's, you get energy out when you make a bond because the substances are becoming more stable. So anything that's more stable tends to have a lower potential energy attached to it. So you would get energy out in that respect. Okay, so you might be wondering where I got that 436 kilojoules per mole number from, and it is straight out of the ASQ Higher and Advanced Higher Chemistry Days book, but on page 10. So I've put a little screenshot over here. On that page, you will also find the entities of formation and combustion, which you may need for um, other questions related to chemical energy. But for bond enthalpy, you want the section of that page that I put a box around, a nice blue box there. So you might notice it's split up into two tables. We are going to talk about why that is. Um, so if you are looking for a bond enthalpy value, just make sure you check both tables to make sure that you've got the right bond that you're looking for. Okay. However, we're going to look now at how we actually can use these. So, it is split up into two parts. I'm just taking a bigger crop of it, so this is just the section of that page that you would need. So, some of them have, are in this table that's got a title bond enthalpies. The other one has got mean bond enthalpies. Now, it's still a bond enthalpy. It's still the energy you need to break one mole of those bonds. However, for a bond enthalpy, there is only... That's one exact value because that bond can only exist in one substance, therefore one chemical environment. So there's nothing that's ever going to change that bond. A hydrogen-hydrogen bond will be a hydrogen-hydrogen bond regardless of 
where it is because it's only one hydrogen attached to another hydrogen. Okay, so our bond entropy is an exact value as the bond only exists in one chemical environment. Okay, so that means it can never be in one molecule, so you'll only get a hydrogen to hydrogen bond in a molecule of hydrogen. You only get an oxygen to oxygen double bond in a molecule of pure oxygen. You only get a nitrogen to nitrogen triple bond in a molecule of nitrogen. So you get the idea. I'm not going to go through all of the bonds because you always get a bit bored. I'm just emphasizing the point. Um, so then we come across the mean bond entities. So mean doesn't mean they're not nice. Mean means it's an average. Okay, so these are average values. Okay, so that means that you know you've added lots of numbers up and divided by the number of numbers. So they're average values, and that's because the bond can exist in different chemical environments within different compounds. So I'll write that down and I'll explain it. So average values as the bond can exist in different chemical environments. Within different compounds. So, for example, a carbon to carbon single bond could be surrounded by, well, I can draw some on the side. So, you could have a carbon to carbon single bond that has just all hydrogens around it, if it was a molecule of ethane, okay? Or you could have a carbon to carbon hydrogen bond that was in ethanol, which there's a hydroxyl there. So the electronegativities of all these things around the, the bond is going to affect the bond's strength and therefore the energy you need to break it. So what is around that carbon to carbon single bond affects how much in the bond entropy of the bond. So that's why we have the mean bond entities because they are average values because that bond can exist in different compounds in different chemical environments, therefore, could have different bond entities. So we just take an average. Kind of like we have relative atomic mass, which is the average mass of different isotopes of an atom. So like for ox, um, carbon, you can get carbon-13, carbon-12. Um, but if you look up the data book, it tells you the mass of one mole of carbon is 12 grams. But that's just an average. Okay, So the difference between the bond entropy and the mean bond entropy is that the bond entropy is an exact value because the bond only exists in one chemical environment. The mean bond entropies are average values because the bond can exist in different chemical environments. So, what we are going to look at now is how bond entropy relates to bond strength. So I kind of mentioned this already in the last slide, and it's kind of common sense, makes logical sense to most people, I'm sure. Um, so it, bond entropy is how much energy you need to break one mole of the bonds. So logically, if you need a lot of energy to break one mole of those bonds, you're probably going to be quite strong, those bonds. So you can really use it for just relative strength, so in how the, the strength relates to each other. So if we were going to compare a carbon to carbon single bond and a carbon to carbon double bond, we can conclude that relatively the carbon to carbon double bond is stronger than the carbon to carbon single bond. Okay, so in summary, higher bond entropy means stronger bond. Yeah. And it's all just relative, so you're literally just comparing them. Um, so you could look at all the values in this table and out of the specified bonds given here, you could conclude which one is the weakest, so that would be the one with the lowest bond entropy, and then you could also work out which one is the strongest, because that would have the highest bond entropy. Okay, and so basically if the bond's stronger, you're going to need more energy to break it. I don't need to explain that anymore. 
finish the code. So, if we then look at how this translates into an overall reaction, so you've probably heard about endothermic and exothermic reactions already. So endothermic is where energy is consumed by the reaction, so energy is taken in and the surroundings tend to drop in temperature and that's because it's usually heat energy that's absorbed into the molecules when they become products. Exothermic reactions are ones that release energy and therefore usually the temperature around them increases because they're usually releasing energy in the form of heat. Okay. You've probably by now also seen the reaction pathway diagrams where an endothermic reaction would look like this, where the products have a higher energy than the reactants, and the exothermic one where it would look a bit like this, where the products have a lower energy than the reactants. So here you've lost energy over the course of reaction, here you have gained energy over the course of reaction. On this axis would be potential energy, just how much energy the molecules have stored in their chemical bonds, usually in kilojoules per mole, so that stands for potential energy, not physical education. Okay. Just to clarify. So, in this process here, if I draw it out again, so all we are doing is breaking a hydrogen to hydrogen bond, so we're putting energy in to break this bond, and we're not making any new bonds, so we're not going to get energy out, so this, just by looking at this reaction, you can conclude it is endothermic because you're putting energy in to break a bond and getting no bonds made, so you're not going to get energy in, any energy out at all. We will eventually, in another video, look at how we calculate um, the entropy changes with bond entropies for more complex reactions, but if you're given something in like a multiple choice, you can sometimes work out potential and exothermic just by looking at if you're making any bonds or breaking any bonds. Okay, so you're having to put... 436 kilojoules of energy in to break one molecule of bonds. If we go over to this one here, we've got chlorine and another chlorine reacting to form chlorine. So here we are not breaking any bonds because these chlorine atoms haven't made any bonds initially and then we are forming a bond. So just as in the data booklet on page 10, the bond entropy for a chlorine to chlorine bond is given as 243. If you were breaking that bond, it would be plus 243 kilojoules. However, because in this instance we're making that bond, it's negative 243 kilojoules. So when you break that bond, you would have to put 243 kilojoules of energy in. But when you make the bond, you get that same amount of energy out. Okay, so this would be an exothermic reaction and you could look at this as being exothermic straight away because you're not breaking any bonds here but you're making bonds here so you're not putting energy in but you're going to get some out okay so sometimes you can identify if a reaction is endothermic or exothermic just by seeing if there's any bonds being made or any bonds being broken okay if there are ones being made or broken and there are ones being made then you usually have to do the longer calculation which we'll do in another video Okay, so hopefully you now can state the definition of a bond entropy. Explain the difference between bond entropy and mean bond entropy. Use bond entropy values in the data book clip to determine the relative strength of a bond and also explain endothermic and exothermic reactions in terms of bond making and bond breaking. So actually what I'm going to do is give you an extra note on this bond breaking, bond making. So if I actually just, oh dear, if we go back to this slide. So if a reaction, because these ones are really straightforward and you were just breaking some here, not making any, making some here, not breaking any. But in general, if you, and it is fairly logical again, so let's say you have to put in a lot of energy to break the bonds, then you are going to, then you get out making the bonds, then obviously that reaction is going to end up being endothermic because you're putting more energy in to break them than you're getting out making them. 
the same thing goes for exothermic. So if you get more energy out of making the bonds than you do breaking them initially, then the reaction will be overall exothermic. Yeah. You can kind of think of it like a bank balance. So if you're putting loads of money into your bank and not withdrawing much, then you're obviously, your bank balance is most likely going to be positive, which is the case for if it's endothermic because you're putting more energy in than you're getting out and it's got a positive energy change. For exothermic, if you're not putting very much money into your bank, but you're taking loads out, then you're going to end up probably with a negative bank balance. Hopefully not, because nobody really wants to be overdrawn. Um, but yeah, so you're going to end up with negative, which is what the entropy changes for an exothermic reaction. So if you're taking it, getting out more energy than what's going in, you're overall going to have a negative entropy change. Okay, so it's this bit's here that kind of explain that. All right, so if you want to write it out more fully, so more energy required to break the bonds than is given out to making the bonds for endothermic and for exothermic more energy is given out making the new bonds than is required to break the bonds in the reactants. Okay, so that's it for this video. So hopefully that gave you a clear introduction to bond entropy and what it is and you can watch the next video on the longer bond entropy calculations that come up more often in the exam. Thank you!